of each of us moving towards the cross, moving as we're back towards the cross. Oh, I don't want to say back. I just want to say more so moving towards the cross. And so we have this time to go and, of course, going back, we're going back to the foundation of our faith. And so it's critical to do it, but perhaps in this season where we are on the earth more than ever before, to think about going back to the cross. So many things are going on in our world. There's never been a time, I, 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 in my experience, where there's been so much upheaval in the Christian world. You may or may not sort of uh, be in tune with that, but in my sense, there's a great deal of upheaval. And I just have to tell you, it's not the first time on the earth there's been all kinds of false doctrines. But we used to think of false doctrines back there, and I can tell you they're right. They're all over the place. False doctrines are popping up all over the place. False doctrines regarding grace and many other things. And, and there are far out prophecies going on, kind of just out there that really aren't connected to anything that, that, that's rooted and anchored in what God has said before. And there are supposedly very real scientific challenges to our faith. You know, the, um, the science world and the, uh, the academic world just think faith is kind of hogwash, silly. And there are those sorts of challenges. And that touches each of us. We heard about touching earlier. Um, so those things are going on. And then, um, uh, and there are, then there are other faith traditions that are truly challenging our faith. Our faith in the Muslim religion is, uh, is gaining strength in America. And uh, people are paying attention. And folks who have not otherwise perhaps um, been uh, touched, uh, they are, many are coming to the, to the Muslim faith, to the Muslim religion. That's a challenge in a time we've never had to. Not to mention men and women of God, pastors I'm talking about, falling into sin and doing all manner of things and then justifying themselves. I just think there's more of that than there's ever been before. And so there are a lot of challenges so that we are right to look back towards the cross and to sort of look at this again. <clears throat> in addition to all of that, and this is just a horrendous thing that happens in the church, there are all manner of compromises with the world system yeah. where the church begins to come into agreement with worldly ideas. And there's a sort of pragmatism. Well, if we don't sort of accommodate worldly thinking, people won't come. And that, what that means is, it means that you're, you're not grounded on the Bible, you're not grounded on the truth. You're grounded in the institutional well-being or your job or uh, us being together, whatever the case is. And that is everywhere. I hear bishops talk this way, and that's on camera. They do. And it's, it's really a struggle to sort of understand that. So they're um, compromised with the world system. And it really has to do with the desire to receive the approval of man. It's really for the world to approve us. So we let the world kind of determine how we should be. And our job is the other way around. We should be such an example of salt and light that changed the world, not what's going on today. And it's, it, it, this is why we should look back at the cross. <clears throat> In addition to those things I've mentioned, there's always temptation as the world system and our fleshly nature constantly to deal with. So there's another reason that we should look back at the cross. So there's a lot going on. And, but before we think about turning again towards the cross, let's have an even closer look at what turns men and women away from the cross. And um, I think perhaps this will help us understand a little better. This is not an exhaustive list, but, and really, um, I'll start with the first one. My, um, my grandkids were over um, Friday, you know, and they're three and down, and one of them is going to be 12, but three of them are three and down. And so, where we live, there's a vast sort of vast, there's a real open place, and it, it you know, it's, I don't know, maybe two miles or a mile and a half or something before there's a tree line. And so when the sun goes down, it comes down directly in front of our house. And usually it's glorious. I mean, anytime there's no clouds, the sun is absolutely glorious. So <clears throat> we had all the little kids outside and they're sitting on the stoop. 
this little family, you know, for watching because it's that far away. When it's that far away at the horizon, you can see it plop down pretty quick, you know, it drops down pretty quick. So we were all engrossed in that and sort of wow and don't take care of them. Not good. So their mom explained that what they tell her is that the sun, at the end of the day, the sun goes into the earth. And then uh, way out beyond it goes into the earth. And then later on, then the moon comes out of the earth. That's how it works. Well, now, it, that all seemed quaint and cute and all that kind of stuff. And so, and we all, we all like that because we have this profound superior knowledge. That's not quite right. So we just look at that and, and say, <clears throat> isn't that cute how they look at that? You know, because we have such profound knowledge. No, 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 but it's just cute to see how they look at it. Well, um, it's, the, it's the sort of uh, understanding throughout the whole world about ignorance. If you just don't know, you will have, even as a child, a three-year-old, you'll have some desire to explain what you see. Some desire to give account for or to come up with a credible way to understand what you see. The sun god Ra in Egypt thousands and thousands of years ago came about for this very reason. They saw the sun come up and they understood the sun gave life. So they worshiped the sun. And so there are all kind of exotic and very intricate ways of worshiping and how the pharaohs were holy and how you had to bury them properly and in such a way with the right entrance to whereby when the sun was in the right part of the ark, they could escape and get up to be with him. Oh, it was very, very, very intricate. But it's based on just trying to figure it out. But it's ignorant. And so from there, all, all other kind of gods came into the world, all to do with, you know, needing uh, harvest and fertility and, and needing children and all manner of things. And they devised ways of understanding and made these uh, gods to understand. But people were corrupt. And so they also made sort of all kind of uh, unmentionable gods for all kind of lascivious type purposes. So there's all manner of things that come out of ignorance. Second Timothy says, Second Timothy 2, 13 says, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. See, people around us are going to want to argue about things for which they don't really have a foundation. They just have some pent up idea or something, and he says, just don't get involved in that. Because that's just, all that's going to do is cause you to either, um, I mean, just be aware of that because it comes out of ignorance. Ignorance simply means that, that they're not aware. Really, it's the word ignore. You all know what ignore means, not to have paid attention, right? So they don't know the truth. So and sometimes you just don't know about the truth. But, but ignorance is a real reason people are not at the cross. It's throughout the world, if they don't know about the cross, it's hard to get to the cross. Can you say amen to that? So there's a reason that people are turned from the cross. I don't say turned, but are not at the cross. And another one is superstition. You know, I lived in Ireland, and I can tell you about superstition. There's all kinds of crazy ideas and, and about uh, when cows are going to milk and when they're not going to milk. And I'm serious now. All this kind of superstitious stuff, that, 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 and they follow this and follow that, and it just comes out of a an idea of, um, of being scared or worried that something bad's going to happen. So there's sort of fear and worry produces superstition. And that superstition, that kind of thing, God says also, um, but to uh, have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself with the purposes of godly. So worldly fables, just, just ideas that make no sense. Well, if you watch enough television, and I'm not asking you to, but if you see enough shows speculating about stuff, a bunch of it is just fables, stuff made up to pull you in and be gullible. Like, wow, it fables, okay? Take you away from the cross. Isaiah, this is to do with foolishness, Isaiah 44, 24 and 25. And I just go through this a little bit. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens for myself and spreading out the earth all alone. So he gives an account for creation, right? Then he says, causing the omens of boasters, here we go with superstitions, 
the omens of boasters to, be, to fail, making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back, and turning their knowledge into foolishness. All manner of foolishness goes on. The people are saying all kind of things that have no foundation, have no sense, just their own puffed up opinion, and but people pay attention to it. This is what's wrong. We, all kind of people, and it draw, even if you're inclined or you knew a little bit, you can be drawn away by foolishness. It all depends where you stand and how you know the Bible. How about vanity? To be vain, to be sort of um, full of yourself to some degree. It says in 2 Peter 2.18, for speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while, they're, while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For, for by what a man is overcome, uh, by this he is enslaved. So here we go, vanity, people appealing to your vanity. Does that happen even in church? Absolutely. People wanting to be in this committee or people, you know, wanting to have this label or this title or be able to uh, hold this or say that or what have you, appeal to vanity, all over the place in church. Is it, does it happen in professional clergy? Everybody can say amen to that, because I can promise you that happens. It's not, it's, not it's not a knock on United Methodism. This is all professional clergy. There's vanity. Well, I'm running 300. What are you running? That's the way they talk. They talk. We talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, we talk. Pride's very simple. But it takes, you, can you feel it? It the, these things occur in everyday life. You are, you touch this in everyday life. There are people around you in everyday life. These influences come across you in everyday life. There are things said in everyday life. You encounter things on television and other places by so-called authorities in everyday life where it waters down, draws down, weakens, or it otherwise causes you to not be moving towards the cross but stopped up maybe and perhaps even going in another direction. Pride, Daniel 4, 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, appraise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Amen. I don't know that if you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar, but you know he had a rough time for about 15 years because he, he wouldn't follow God, and he was so sure of how big he was. And you know, that's if you're so sure how big you are, you're certainly not moving towards God. And, and we all have pride. Now you may not want, I have pride. You have, we all have pride. It's either flat out moving us or lurking ready to move us. You know, I, I like to use this, um, this little story, you know. I, I use this all the time. You find you haven't seen anybody in a long time, find out how they're doing, so, yeah. And say, uh, yeah, I, I had to go get three valves. And my heart does. Oh, really? How are you doing? Good, good, good. Yeah, I went to Dr. Um, Dr. Big Shot, who's in Kansas City, and he's the uh, best cardiac doctor uh, west of the east of the Mississippi. You ever hear people talk like that? Yes. That, that's that's pride by association. Like I'm that important. You ever hear people talk like that? Why do people say that? Pride. They want you to think that they're somebody. That's all. That is all that is. Now, we might say no to that because we all tend to do it, but it's pride. Better to say, you know, I, he, he's a good doctor. He's well regarded. Better to say that. If you get an amen to that. Amen. amen. <laughs> Very nice. Well, I need to talk to you in the back, young man. <laughs> all right, where are we? Pride. Okay. <laughs> a lot of amens. <laughs> yeah. Anybody can claim that. Yeah. So any male person. So um, then a rebellion. Now you would say, well, clear, clearly rebellion is going to get in the way. And, and and it says in Isaiah 30 and 1, Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan but not mine, and make an alliance but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin. And there's rebellion even in Christians. 
There's part of us, we'll read the Word of God and say, well, I'm just not going to do that. And, um, and I'm not putting that on you, but I walked through that where I didn't care for that. And that's rebellion. You don't want to buckle under it because uh, you don't want to. All right, we don't need any amens to that. I just leave that. Amen. But it's, it's no, I'm, not, I'm not teasing them out. I'm just saying I'll leave it. The thing before it's all right. It's good. Then human wisdom. This is a big thing that will cause us to stumble and move away from the cross. Human wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2 and 13. Which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom. This is Paul talking about. Talking, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. Human wisdom is demands to have understanding before it will acknowledge. You follow? It demands to have understanding before us human wisdom. It has to fit inside your ability to understand it. And that, that, that'll cause you to stumble. Therefore, if you don't understand it, you're not moving towards the cross. You're holding back. You follow where this goes, right? Now, what about thankfulness? Okay, thankfulness. Romans 1 21 says, even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God and give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were was darkened. Didn't honor Him or give thanks. Let me tell you, humility and thanksgiving are brothers and sisters. They are. Let me tell you, if you begin to thank God, it will absolutely radically change your life. If you think you thank Him that you woke up in the morning, Thank Him that you can uh, breathe and you've got, you've got uh, the ability to get out of the bed and move about and begin to plan your day and ask Him to come in. Thank Him and every last little thing you do. If you start to do that, you will absolutely radically change. Not only if you do that, you will grow in humility. No, it says humble yourself. That, you want to know how to do that? Start thanking Him. Because you'll begin to see more and more and more of how good God is once you start to thank Him. I could preach just about that. Thanking Him is such a powerful, powerful, powerful tool. Never, ever walk around just taking it for granted because we tend to do that. Yes. We tend to say, I'm blessed and that's it. But no, thank Him every moment of the day that you can. Thank Him, thank Him, thank Him. You'll stay in that lowly place of being able to hear Him and to receive from Him and to be molded by Him and to be changed by Him. And you might think, well, I don't have that much to be thankful. Start thanking Him, then you'll find out how much you have to be thankful for. Amen. Because you'll, you'll reap what you sow. Amen. Amen. Thankfulness. And it says, they refuse to honor Him as God and give thanks. You see, remember, Jesus said, if you don't praise me, or thank me, more or less, then the rocks are going to do it. Why did He say that? Because there is no other response once you're aware of who God is. If you don't thank Him, more or less, that's close to rebellion. Why would you not thank Him? And yet we forget to do that. So thanking Him draws us or holds us from coming closer to God. And this one is fairly evident. Uh, lust, 1 John 2 and 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So all those things keep you from going towards the cross. See, we, our challenge, all of our challenges is to hear what God says to us and realize that even the things that are hard to hear are His love towards us. Because the devil wants you to feel that the things that are hard to hear are somehow judgment or condemnation, but it's exactly the opposite way around. Because only the truth really is able to shake you up and change you, set you free. So, um, so the, the whole question about um, this question of uh, lust, it gets all of us. All of us are tied up in some way with things in the world that pull at us. And all God is saying is understand that when you do this, it keeps you... There. Now, at this, somewhere along the way, you might be going to think, well, you know, all right, uh, going towards the cross. So where are you going with that? You know, Pastor, well, well, we'll get there in just a little but those things are clearly in our way and God just brings them before us, not condemning, just saying those are, just be aware. And here's one too that's a vital one for us and one you don't hear too much. Rejecting the love of the truth. Now let's read that from, second, from uh, 
Thessalonians uh, 2 and 10. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 10. And with all, <clears throat> excuse me, and with all the deception of wickedness of those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now, now we're getting closer to preaching about the cross. When the word of God is preached in earnest, preached with the right heart, and when I say earnest, fervently, and preached with zeal, it releases understanding, faith, and with the faith and understanding, if you will begin to take hold of it, it also releases love for the truth. The, the lesser that we take hold of the word preached, the less we will love the truth. The more we take hold of what is being preached, the more we will glorify God, the more we will delight in God, and the more we'll love the truth. And what it's saying, and the, the love of the truth has to come to us, because it says they did not receive it. Can we say amen to that? Amen. So we have to understand the goodness of God in, in how He deals with us and how He wants to get it to us. There was, in the prayer room this morning, there was um, a great um, uh, sense of the... Um, the wonder of his love and the reality of his love and the riches of his love. And it's in measures that we don't quite understand entirely. And so the people, this is a sort of a very difficult thing to hear. People did not receive the love for the truth. So they said, that's good. Well, I can understand that. Well, I'll think about that. And each time you get to that place, if, if the word of God is preached clearly, you know, urgently or, or fervently and passionately in love, not condemning, but in love. And we stand back and say, well, I'll examine that and so forth and so on. Then we, we miss it and we're not receiving love for the truth. We're really, what we're really doing is, is, um, uh, is uh, uh, shoring up our own defenses to the truth. You follow what I'm saying? Rejecting the love of the truth. Okay, if that's not enough, in these times we also have doctrines of demons and we also have deceitful spirits. Those are things that we could say that work in us, but now here is the demonic forces also working against us. Now this is more difficult because you can't quite put your finger on a lot of this stuff. But 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, which is now, some will fall away from the truth, from the faith, uh, paying attention to the deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. So what it's saying is, you're being drawn away from the church a lot by what you see on television. Honestly, that's how that is. Amen. What comes across your computer? Amen. What might come across your phone? What might be in your church? God forbid this church. But I'm serious, corrupted, corrupted, corrupted dogmas and doctrines, and, and doctrines in the church. Sometimes denominational, sometimes other things. But there are doctrines of demons, seducing, deceiving, and taking people away. And you're moving away from the cross. All of those things are in play. Every day, you're confronted with all those things. And some of you might get to the place where you think, well, goodness gracious, of all of that is going on, what hope is there for the church? I would say that's a fair question. If we see millions and millions and millions of otherwise known Christians no longer part of the church and uh, want to go independent or be a TV uh, Christian. I'll just sit in my armchair and, and uh, be a Christian. Well, that's just not going to work. It might work for a week or a month or even a year or two, but it's just not going to work. You will fall away. You will. And so in this past... 25 years, about 25 million Christians who formerly named Christ as, as their Lord and Savior no longer name Him. How does that happen? This year. All these things. All the deceptions. And I'm not saying about all the other things that perhaps we could say, you know, how much of it could be on us. I'm just saying about these things that are pulling against us, these other influences that touch us. This is happening right now, right today. Let me say more, and I don't speak prophetically that much. It's happening more now than it's ever happened before, and it's just the beginning of the chaos. 
there's going to be chaos and realms that we haven't even thought about. And, and all manner of things coming up that we can't quite explain or can't quite understand. And we'll compel ourselves to be able to understand it. And God says, be careful with that. Amen. Who set you up to be above everything? And your faith will be tested because you won't be able to quickly give an answer or quickly be able to explain it to yourself, all the things that are coming on the earth. <laughs> you already feel it. This is not news. You already, you already sense it, what's going on in the schools, what's going on in, uh, in entertainment, what's going on everywhere. You sense it everywhere. It's happening right now. For it says this in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, Starting in verse 7. For the mystery of all is already at work. So that was back then. So it's already happened. <clears throat> Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So there is still some restraint. Can we say amen to that? Thank God for that. But the day will come where he will take the restraint back. That is to say, in the Lord's timing, when it's necessary for the conclusion of all things, the Holy Spirit in that protective way will be removed. So I hope everybody is girded up at that point. Amen. I'm not just going to say that. I mean, there's an urgency in me for every one of us to understand this. Amen. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan and with all power and signs and false wonders. And that's starting to happen. Um, and with all the deception of wickedness, this is the stuff we're talking about. And those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. We talked about that. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. My goodness. Wow. Hear it. The day will come where it will no longer be within your purview to make up your mind. Because the day will come where God will quicken. You'll either be there or you'll be here. Amen. It's the word of God. Hear it this morning. And there's, no, there's no threatening. There's no warning. There's no, we're talking about moving towards the cross. Can we say amen? amen? And understand why God's heart is for us to understand this. To move towards the cross. Because there's such a weight of influence. And such... Um, a strategy and combination of factors that are truly drawing people away and people being casual with the Lord, casual with the Word of God, casual with what they, their morals or what they believe is okay and not okay, completely sort of uh, at the surface Christian. And I'm not, this is not for you all. I'm just saying in general. I mean, to whatever measure it applies, but I'm just saying in general. All right, so... It says in Acts 13 40, let's turn it around and go in the other direction here a little bit. Move towards the cross, okay? Amen. Amen is right. Um, um, when the Gentiles, this is Acts 13 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorify, glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Amen. So when they heard the good news of the gospel, it says, now this is really a sort of theological verse here, but I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, uh, began rejoicing, glorifying God, by the word of uh, glorifying the word, glorifying and glorifying the word of the Lord, as many as have been appointed to eternal life believe. So, um, so it means that, that God, God has appointed you to have eternal life if you believe. Can you say amen? That's how that is. He has appointed you to have eternal life if you believe. And that means if you don't believe, then you, he's appointed you not to have eternal life. So it's straight, straight, straight. There's no place in the middle. So what was it that they heard? Well, they heard the gospel, but we're going to present it to you uh, in another place here for just a moment. And really, we'll uh, um, cross. You've heard this all before, but you're going to hear it today in relief to what I've said to you are all the elements, all, all the factors, everything that's at war in your spirit, in your life, in your family, in your workplace to 
take you from the cross. In relief to that, does God have a plan? And here we go. God has always got a plan. God has had an eternal plan. It would be impossible for God not to have a plan. <clears throat> All right, so Paul is speaking, this is 1 Corinthians, and he says the following, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, I mean, he has baptized some a little bit, but more important than baptizing is the preaching of the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would be made void. So the central point in all of this is the cross of Christ. So the critical thing is that that gets preached not eloquently, not with all kinds of um, sort of flowery doctrinal phrases and, and all manner of different little kind of possible insights and all those kind of things, not sort of propping up um, your desire to have um, eloquence and all of our desire and it to be presented so finely or so nicely or humanly done so well. Do you follow because we all kind of want it done so well. And he says, well, no. Um, for Christ did not sent me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Because you start to preach out of you, then you're going to avoid the, the cross of Christ. How does that happen? Preaching out of you. Trying to be eloquent. Trying to be clever. Trying to tell too many jokes. At saying, being flattering, uh, or or shading the truth, or or explaining the truth, as if to say the truth is too hard for you to take, and you try to water it down somehow. You follow? Yeah. All those kind of things happen in every church, and this church, and me sometimes, because we're all human. But not to void the cross would not be made void for the word of the cross. Here we go. The word of the cross. What's the central focus of the gospel? The word of the cross. Can we say amen? amen? It is the foundation for your faith. It is the word of the cross. So, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. That is to say, they will demand to have an understanding. They will demand to bring it into their ability to understand and so forth. <clears throat> and of course, you have to surrender your understanding. Because it's not going to happen that way. So, so... This is, this is what breaks you or gets you in, right here. It will break you or get you in. The preaching of the cross. It will, and it will never change. As dark and as bad and as awful as it's ever going to be on this earth, it will be the preaching of the cross. Only the preaching of the cross. Only that will get people to come and break through all that other trashy stuff that I've said. If they're appointed to come and their ears are able to hear it, then it will be the preaching of the cross. Can we say amen? amen? For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Really? That is the power of God. The word of the cross. Praise God. There is something that God has reserved for himself. And it works this way. If you preach the cross and you preach it fervently, truthfully, completely, honestly, there's power released into the hearts of men and women. They have the ability to believe no matter what else they heard, no matter what all the junk is, they have the ability to believe and know this is truly God. Amen. It is the power of God. Hallelujah. The word of the cross. We must go back to the cross. Must. We must go back to the cross. It is the power of God. Hallelujah. He has reserved, he has reserved the love of the truth in that. Because it transcends every other thing. It is the foundational work in all of creation. The cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. We can't ever wander from it. We can't ever get away from it. We can't ever get lost in all other kind of stuff. All kind of mindless discussions and things of ignorance and fables. All the stuff. That, well, all the fables. All the TV shows. We're saying, Maybe it happened this way. Maybe it happened that way. Maybe Noah did this. Maybe so and so did that. No. We come back to the cross. And here's what we have to swallow. We have to swallow our own vanity. And God will help us with that. Amen. We'll have to swallow our own pride. And God will help us with that. We're going to have to swallow our own intellectualism. And God will help me with that. So. That's <laughs> okay. So. But the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to 
us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. You can be as wise as you want to be. I'm not going to be any good human wisdom. And the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. All those things you're taking from the cross. Set them down. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of the world, for since in the wisdom of the world, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Isn't that wonderful? All these wise people, all these scientists and so forth, but that hasn't brought them to God, has it? But it cannot take you away from God. Hear me now. Because that's what it wants to do. So you must go back to the cross. Amen. You must go back to your understanding of what happened at the cross. What was broken at the cross. What was released at the cross. What was given at the cross. God is well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Hallelujah. The plain message of the cross is foolishness to everybody except those who have a heart to hear. And it's not to do with your understanding. It has to do with the love and the power of Almighty God. So if you've been worried about how am I going to explain this to anybody? How am I going to get anybody to understand? You don't have to worry anything about that. You present the cross honestly, purely, and in love. And then God does the work and we say amen. He releases power. He releases grace. He releases the ability for them to understand and praise the living God. And it's the only thing he's done. We don't have to get confused. It's the only prescription. It's the only thing that we need to do. Hallelujah. For since in the wisdom of the world, through the world, uh, through its wisdom did I come to know God, God was well placed through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, <clears throat> Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Here we go. Prove it is the Jews. Wisdom is, uh, I need to understand it, right? But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, stumbling block, and to Gentiles' foolishness. All the things we talked about that take you from the cross. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. We go to the cross. That's why we have a time at Easter to go back to the cross, to understand everything is not in play. Everything is not falling apart. Everything is not weird. It's not. God is in control. We simply go back to the cross. In our own hearts, we go back to the cross. Yes, he came for me. Yes, he will do it for me. Yes, he will manifest his truth in me. I will only agree with what I hear about Jesus in the word of God. Nowhere else. Amen. Nowhere else. Because you'll have all kind of influences trying to pull you all manner of directions. Praise God. Praise God. Well, pretty well. You've got this so we can just kind of uh, finish up. Because the foolish of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For consider your calling, brethren, that <clears throat> there were not many wise according to the flesh, and not many mighty, nor many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. How I think you, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It is the people who say, yes, I'll be humble. Yes, I believe God. Yes, I know he loves me. And see, to the, to the wise, that's foolishness. But to God, it's wonderful. Yeah. Which camp are we in? We're in. We're in that camp where, you know, read it again. For consider your calling, that's us, brother, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things, that's me, the foolish things, and that's you to some degree, of this world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong, praise God. Now, in the natural man, we don't want to say those things, but if we give God praise and we humble ourselves and believe God, then he will make us strong in all those things. If we'll come to him that way. That's his way. And the base things of the world are despised. And, and the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he can nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, Boast in the Lord. Amen. Let me tell you, we're moving to the cross. Amen. We're moving towards the cross. So in your heart, that's, read, you know, in your own heart, that's 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 17. I just encourage you through this Easter time to get this, because God has told you there will be all kinds of wild speculations. People will talk about this proof and that proof. That has been disproved. It's impossible to believe. It's impossible. The only thing you can believe is science is 
It's finished, closed science. You, have you heard those kinds of statements? It's finished, closed science, and therefore you can't question it. It's almost like that now with global warming. It's finished, closed science. You can't, you can't question it. And it's a, it's a sort of a demanding spirit that makes it, says you must yield before me. So I want to pray for you all this Easter. If any of these things, you know, you, if you want to pray in your seat, pray in your seat. But God, all God is what, well, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. What God wants from us this morning is to understand if we've been upset, fretful, um, annoyed, uneasy, um, shaking, any of those things, what we hear going on in the news, or what we hear going on, you know, that's the devil's way with us to get us so worried about this and what are we all going to do about that and so forth and so on. You know, we can't be that way. Can we say amen, church? Amen. You know, we have to believe it the other way around. I believe this <clears throat> in my own heart. And I don't want to get all modeling and all that kind of stuff. I believe that a church like ours, I don't want to say ours because then it gets private, but a church like ours, where we come with a measure of yielded humility, a measure of desiring to see God show up in his full potential, Amen. a measure of not trusting in our own strength, but yeah. trusting in the Lord's strength. I believe that God has done that here. Yes. And he will continue to do that here. Amen. And he will confound the wise here. The wise will be confounded through this church. Yes. Things will happen here that will not really be able to be understood. Amen. Because there's a lot of weak things here, a lot of broken things here, a lot of hurt things here. And God is going to show wonderful things through those very things. If we do the way he says. Amen. Not get distracted. We heard that last week or whatever it was. Yes. Last week, yeah. Not, not get distracted. And realize there are many, many factors trying to take us away from the cross, although, you know, they're so subtle we don't really feel them. But for us, I don't really can't quite uh, enumerate them or uh, isolate them. But what God is saying to us this morning, simply go back to the cross and the word of the cross. That is my whole game plan. Isn't that wonderful? That's his whole game plan. The word of the cross. The whole game. If you preach the cross, the cross, the cross, then everything that they need to get saved is right there, and no worldly thing can stop them if they've been appointed to be saved. Can we say amen? amen. Praise the living God. Praise God for His goodness. We don't need to try to intellectualize it. We don't need to try to make it fancy. We don't need to try to make it glitzy. We don't have to soften it down. We don't have to try to say that we're good. We don't have to socialize it. We just say, God died for us at the cross. Amen. Preach the cross. Preach the cross. Okay, well, I'm going I'm to say a word of prayer, and uh, if anyone wants to um, come and have a word of prayer, you're fine. Really, this, this sermon, it relates to sort of um, good news to you to, uh, to rejoice in. That God sees you, He understands your heart, not to despair, but to rejoice in everything He's doing. You feel God in that? Yeah. that? That's really what He wants for you, not to be despairing, to have faith that nothing bad is going on. I mean... Nothing beyond what God understands is going on. Things are going to be fine. We simply go back to the cross. So. Now, I just need to say, if there's anyone here who, um, for whatever reason, has never really got to that place where they've met Jesus at the cross and realize that it's very personal for the Lord and that he died for each one of us so that we could have this relationship with him that we can be saved, that is to say, we can yield to Him all of our sins, all of our disappointments, all of our hurts, yield to all of our plans, yield to Him, surrender to Him, ask Him to forgive us, and to come in, to believe that He is God, to come in and live inside us, give us His Holy Spirit, and live through us, and have a new life in Christ. And all these promises and all these truths become yours. And if you're not that person here this morning, realize that you'll never be able to understand God truly without being saved. The natural man doesn't understand these things. If you don't know Jesus Christ, today is your day. Simply yield at your seat. Yield at your seat and say, God, I believe. I want to be saved. I want you, Jesus. I want my life to be changed. I want to give you all the junk, all the heartache, all my own plans. I want to surrender to you. I want you to forgive me, Lord Jesus. Cleanse me from all that stuff. Come in and live within me. 
and I will live for you and you will live in me. Now, if that's really your heart, say that to him. Say that to him. And the Bible says you will be saved if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You will be saved. So I invite you to do that. If you do that, we rejoice. Come speak to us if you've done that. But Lord, I just want to pray over this for people. These are your people. Lord, we want to make a, a commitment in our heart. I do. I'm going to put it to you this way. For me, Lord God, um, I've asked you to help me order my priorities. I've asked you to help me make it where they're, while I'm still human and things change, but order them. And I'm asking you for that, for this entire congregation, God, that you would truly order our priorities. You would always look back to the cross to what Jesus has done. And if you want to leave something with Jesus today, I just invite you to come to the altar. If you want to leave something where you've been caught up in any of this stuff, distracted by any of this stuff, then you can come. But I want to pray for all of us, Lord God, order our priorities, God. David made a prayer, Lord God, that you would keep them close to you. You would bring it to his attention. You would bring it to his mind, God. And Lord, I know desperately I need that. Desperately, dear God. Father, to be ordered in such a way as close to you without religion, without condemnation, without legalism. I want to pray a blessing over your people, Lord God. They hunger for you, God. But Lord, I want to confess for all of us, we're still sheep and we're wanderers, God. And we need a shepherd, Lord God. We do. Lord, we need a shepherd. So, Lord God, help us in these areas. We want to be strong. We do, God. We want to be, Father, united in the love of Jesus Christ. We want to claim the cross, God, the redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we would never bury from it, dear God. We would uphold the cross in all things, Father, for what you've done, how great the Father's love for us. We should be called children of God and such that we are. How wonderful to have a Savior who would die for us. Jesus, we love you in this place. And, oh God, that we would come after you. Jesus, we would come after you. We would come after you day after day after day after day. And, Lord, here's how it is to be human. You know it, that we want it right now. And you know we can't quite do it that way. But, Lord, we still say to you we want it right now. So, Lord, bring it into our lives. Bring fullness, dear God. Bring intimacy. Bring priority. Bring devotion, dear God. Bring faith, Lord God. We ask your Holy Spirit to come here in the name of Jesus Christ.